also welcome those who are online, that God, who has brought you to be part of the service, will reach you right where you are. And for those of you that are physically here, God bless you. You are very welcome in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God is a good God. I say our God is a good God. In the mighty name of Jesus. We are on the fourth of our series on embracing ministry gifts for restful increase. Uh, those of you that may be watching this for the first time, by the grace of God, God helps us as a church to take series one at a time and we just teach through. This was a revelation God gave to me when I was praying at the beginning of the ministry, asking God that, Lord, I want to, I believe that a church should always have a Bible school and, um, and those things we used to do traditionally, Sunday school, Bible school, and uh, we used to have them separately. We would have Sunday school, then we would have the service, and then we would have a, a separate entity called the Bible school, which is all fine. But we are in such a busy world now that it is very difficult to actually get those kind of things well established. And uh, not that they are not happening anymore, but it's becoming more and more challenging for our world because of our busyness. And God made me to see that we can have everything in one. And since that day, we have embraced this model of being a teaching style service. And that is why you would watch that every, for the past five, six years, uh, every service has been themed and it's part of a series. Please avail yourself of those materials. God was telling me some things about them this morning as to the next levels we can take them. But I believe that this is something that God is inspired to build a strong people. And as many that will be joining into what God is doing with us here, physically or online, I believe that God will be producing such results of strength and stamina of the faith in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are on the fourth of our Embracing Ministry Gifts for Restful Increase, which today we'll be looking at the pastoral ministry. We have looked at the apostolic, the prophetic. Last week, Pastor Moses led us in looking at the evangelistic. And today, by the grace of God, we are looking at the fourth. Remember the five fingers? We have the apostolic, which was like the thumb. And we say that is the uh, ministry that God has given to govern. And then the prophetic, which is the first finger or the index finger, as it's called, the one that is always pointing. And we say it's the one that is more about, uh, you know, pointing direction, which is like guidance. And then last week, we talked about the third one, which is the tallest of the fingers as it is. We say it's the evangelistic. The tallness of it reminds us of the fact that it's the going out ministry, the gathering ministry, the one that is always there. And I said last week that if the evangelistic ministry is not functional in the church. I'm not just talking about life gate. In the body of Christ today, we will suffer spiritual, uh, uh, um, what do you call this thing, obesity. We will suffer spiritual obesity. We will, we will be insular. And that is not God's intention. God's intention, what brings vibrancy in church is the fact that the believers are added to. Hallelujah. That's what brings the vibrancy. Thank God for what we do as churches locally. But what brings vibrancy? They were 120. And then suddenly, 2,000 was added to them. Suddenly, 3,000 were added to them. Then at a the time, they stopped counting. They would just say, many came to the Lord. That is what brought the vibrancy of the early church. If 120 people had continued for 50 years, the church would have died out by now would have died out. There would have been you and I not here as part of that church. So the evangelistic ministry is so important. Always seeking to reach out with every tool God gives to us to gather people in, to go for the unsaved, go for those who might have been discouraged and disappointed, but prim primarily for those who are unsaved. But today we come to the very important ministry, which I believe without which we cannot really have church. We can have something of the body of Christ, but the structure of the church rests so much on the pastoral ministry. This is the guarding ministry, the guarding of those who have been gathered, the guarding of those who have been gathered. 
So thank God for the apostolic ministry that always governs and gets direction as to where to plant, what next to do, and all that, and the prophetic that keeps bringing the context of the word of God for the day, and the evangelistic that keeps going out to bring more in. Without the pastoral ministry, we cannot have a formal system of making sure that those who have been gathered are consistently looked after and are helped to, to grow into what God has called them to be. And then next week, we'll look at the teaching ministry, of course. So the church is built by Jesus. I say built because Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus used the word built because the church is built. He didn't say, I will, uh, I will just you know, speak my church into being. He said, I will build my church and then the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we use the word built because Jesus built the church. And the, built, the church that is built has one major purpose, to accommodate those that are being gathered and to make room for as many that will be gathered. So he said, I will build it. And as many that accept his invitation are also uh, put in, their, in the church that is built by faith. Then the church that is built is being called into something called the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And then he has given to them the ministry of reconciliation from verse 20 to verse 22. So we are called as ambassadors in the church to work in this ministry of reconciliation. And so if we are in a ministry... He needs to give us ministry gifts that helps, help us to function in that ministry. So every ministry gift is to help us to function. It is for this purpose that he gave some. Ephesians chapter 4, let's start from there today. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll read again as we've read over the weeks. Verse 7, he said, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Verse 8, Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to man, to men. He gave gifts to men. Now, only a thief will give what is not theirs to another person. Praise the Lord. I used to have a friend. He's, he's gone to be with the Lord now. He was a very, very naughty chap when we were in university those days. And uh, if you were eating and you invited him to come and, and join you, this is university campus. I, he will come and join you. Then anybody he sees passing, he will come and be inviting them. He say, come and eat. There is food here. <laughs> and we always wonder that. You are not the one who started this thing. <laughs> you two were invited. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the reality is that it's a person who has something that has the capacity to give it to another person. Amen. He gave gifts to men. So we must understand that whether we are apostles, pastors, evangelists, teachers, whoever we are, prophets, None of those things, none of those gifts belong to a human being. They belong to Jesus. They are his own. That is why he himself is everything. He is the first apostle. He is the chief prophet. He is the chief, as we will see today. He is the chief shepherd. He is our first evangelist. He is the first one who said to people, come, follow me. He is the first evangelist. So he's the first of everything. So when he was ascending, he led captivity captive, the Bible says, and gave gifts to man. So this should help us to understand. If we don't get this, we will keep thinking that whatever we have as a ministry gift is something we deserved or something that we are just, you know, is just us. It's nothing to do with us. It's nothing to do with us, but with him who gave it to us. And what are those things? Verse 11, as we've read over and over, and he gave some to be what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So today we are looking at the pastoral ministry, which is the fourth in that list. The word pastor, well, before that, the Bible says, verse 12, the equivalent, the, the, it is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. This is the, this is the purpose. No ministry gift is given to us so that we just go about with titles. It is for duty. Equipping the saints. So if somebody says, oh, my name is Prophet this. Okay, what are you doing to equip the saints? What are you doing? Well, you are just prophet. <laughs> what are you doing? You say, I'm pastor this. Who are you pastoring? We have a lot of people today who are teaching online and doing things, which is all good. Which is all good. But you see, you can't teach me about pastoring if you are not pastoring the church. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't. 
You can't. Maybe if you have pastored before and you've, you are now in a situation where God is teaching, helping you to teach pastors, but you cannot be teaching something you are not practicing. You can't. It's wrong. Very wrong. And that is part of the problem of the body of Christ today. He gave them for the equipping. How do you equip somebody? Again, you give something that you have to equip somebody. If I say, I want you to do this work for me, but I need you to use this, my tablet, to do it, then I give you the equipment. It's mine. It's my work. Then I give you the equipment to do it. If I don't know how to use it and I don't, I don't, I don't have it, I can't say, use a tablet to do it. Use my tablet to, to do it. What I'm doing is that I'm telling you things and that you can do, but I'm not really equipping you. This is why the fivefold ministry and every one of us must understand. The Bible says grace has been given to all of us, however we function. And we'll look at some of the ministries that support the fivefold, fivefold after now, uh, after the next week's session. We will look at there are some other ministries that may not necessarily be part of this fivefold, but they feed the fivefold, fivefold and they are also ministries in themselves. But it's very important for us to understand this. We must be practical. We must understand. I was very careful. I've been, I've been in, in teaching duties and being in kind of pastoral offices in the church for many years, ever since I was very young, since I was age 23, 24. I've been in those things, but I've always been very careful when I talked to church leaders for a very long time because I never really held a role until several years ago where I pastored or I'm called to pastor a church. I've worked with many pastors. But there is nothing like pastoring a church in, uh, compared to you know, serving in other kind of pastoral duties. I'm making this emphasis because if we want to make progress in the body of Christ, we need to be very careful what we are listening to. We need to be very careful how we are making sure that the equipping of the saints are taking place. The word pastor comes from the Latin word which just simply means shepherd. Shepherd, a pastor, is therefore to work under Christ to shepherd God's people or God's flock. This is the work of a pastor. Those of you who are joining online or who have just come recently, we read uh, what God spoke through prophet uh, Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 3. We read all the way from verse 12 to 23. But I'm just going to pick a couple of verses. That whole account was what God how God first spoke to a prophet in the Old Testament that he was going to send shepherds. He was going to give a restored people the shepherds that will guide them and feed them. He said to them in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, he said, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Verse 15. And I will, verse 15, let's, let's read verse 15 together, everybody, and online, everybody go. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. The word my is in capital, which means that is God himself. God himself. So God said he would give shepherds. When Jesus was ascending, part of the ministry gifts he gave was the gift of pastors who are to do this shepherding work, and their work is to feed them with knowledge and understanding. Now, the, past the pastoral ministry and the teaching ministry have a lot of similarities. Most pastors are teachers. Most pastors are teachers, but not every teacher is a pastor. And we'll explain that hopefully over this week and next week. So we understand. A pastor can teach, but a pastor has a wider remit more than that of a teacher. A teacher, predominantly, like the name implies, is just to teach, to do that bit of the knowledge and understanding and to break it down further, especially when the pastor has given a framework to what it is, and so on and so forth. But the primary duty of a pastor is to shepherd God's flock. So having been called by Christ into the pastoral ministries, therefore, Pastors must seek to be taking care of the flock under Christ, the chief shepherd. And pastors must understand that their reward will come from him. You see, we have a pastoral ministry and a pastoral crew across the world today who are losing sight of the fact of their calling is heavenly, like the fivefold ministry. Their calling is heavenly. When somebody calls you and sends you to a person, you are responsible to the person who calls you and sends you, primarily. 
You have a duty to deliver what is to be delivered to the people you are sent to, no doubt. But your, res your responsibility and accountability is to the one who sends you. By the grace of God, I've been in this country 20 years, and I've had the privilege of representing the country many times, China and parts of Europe, many times in Nigeria. It's always very funny when I go to Nigeria to represent the UK because I am a Nigerian as well. So it's always usually very interesting for me when I sit on the side of the people and I'm looking and I'll be telling them that in this country, what are you doing about this <laughs> in my own country? <laughs> So when we finish the meeting, some of my colleagues will say, but you know all this. I say, I have to talk like that. I'm, I'm British, you understand. <laughs> I have to ask you those questions as if I don't know because my colleagues do not know. So it's funny. But you know, I've represented the country many times and I find that what is important and in representing the country, representing an organization, anything whatsoever, what is important, what is always ringing in your head is the persons that sent you, the persons that sent you. So when you get to a place and they are arrogant or they are not receiving it well or they are treating you in a way or they are just, you know, misbehaving, somehow all that doesn't, doesn't bother you. You are just trying to make sure you are hitting your targets. Have I met the right people? Have I communicated what I've been asked to come in? Have I got the paperwork done? That's my business. I'm gone. I'm out of, I'm out of here. Two days later, I'm gone. Because you've done your job and you've left. But you see, if you go there and the people are hostile or they're not receiving you, then you become a problem. Uh, it becomes a problem to you and you are not able to deliver back to the one who sends you. That's why Jesus said, if you go to any city and they don't receive you, what did he say? Shake off the dust of your feet and go back. Because they are not the one determining your performance. It is me who sent you and you went and you delivered the message that assesses how you have performed. So I say to anyone call, and when we talk about shepherding God's flock, it is in various levels. Of course, we have pastor over a church. We have pastor over churches, which is more or less like an apostle. Then we have pastor over local congregations, pastor over a church. And then we have within the past, within a church, we have pastors. We don't necessarily always call them pastors. But everyone who is responsible for a unit of people or who is responsible for some kind of follow-up welfare is a pastor. Is a pastor. We may not put the title pastor there, but that is exactly who you are. You are a pastor because we expect you to care for those people, look after their well-being, and we expect, it is expected that you are also teaching them the word of God and exhorting them when necessary. So we must all understand this. Christ remains the chief shepherd, and it is to him every pastor must always seek to get their reward. Whatever level of pastoral calling you have, your pastoral anointing requires you to trust that you will keep receiving your, 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 your blessing or your uh, reward from the chief shepherd. I want to quickly read what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Thank you. We we'll go to verse 4. It said, The elders who are among you, I exhort. I who am a fellow elder, this is Peter speaking, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. This is very important. Paul said, I'm speaking to elders here. I'm speaking to elders. He said, I am also one. The word elders there simply means pastors. They hardly used pastors in their days, but those that were set over churches were called elders. If you look, every time they say they went back and they spoke there with the elders, people like Gaius, they would say elder Gaius, but they were actually pastors of churches. People like Timothy, they were pastors. But the reality is that he said, the elders who are among you, he said, I, and, and, and I caught something here from Peter. I just, in the power tower, I talked about Peter kind of jokingly about when he, he, he denied Christ and uh, Christ had told him that he will pray for him so that, uh, that he has prayed for him, that his faith will not fail him. And that when he is restored, he should uh, uh, strengthen the brethren. So God had given him a ministry. Paul said, I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. If we are to look at it very well, Paul ran away when Christ was doing the real suffering. Peter ran away when Christ was doing the real suffering. And that showed me something. You see, the statement of Peter here shows that a pastor must understand that you must never let your weaknesses come in between you and your work. And every time you find yourself falling short, get up quick 
and move on with the assignment. This is not to say be living in sin. That is very, very wrong. That is very, very off. That is punishable, and God will judge such people. But you see, I want us to understand there is a superstar status that our world is craving to give to our pastors. And wherever this came from, it is not from God. Every pastor is a human being who lives in the flesh like you, who drinks tea and coffee at times with too much sugar like you, who does everything that you do wrong the same way. They are just human beings called into a ministry to serve, to equip you. That does not mean there should not be respect for each of the offices. That does not mean that they should not be treated in double honor, as Paul said, that those who are teaching and in, in such roles be guided double honor. That's not what I'm saying. But you see, the attempt to make superstars out of pastors is killing the body of Christ. Is killing more pastors. More pastors are resorting to drugs privately. They are resorting to things to keep up to try to make that superstar image. A few years ago, we heard that pastors, a pastor was found dead in his, in his hotel room snuffing cocaine. And I sat down for many weeks to think, what must have led a pastor to be sniffing cocaine? If not that he's looking for something to keep him high because of the demand that is placed on him. Sadly, this has come from the idolatrous generation that we have been. If you read Jeremiah where we read earlier from verse 12, he said they had gone a whoring, they had followed other idols, but that he will be restoring them. And when the restoration started, even in the book of Acts, we saw that when Paul and, uh, and, uh, and, um, uh, and um, Barnabas were going around, they came to a place uh, and uh, the people there were about to be worshiping them. They said, this is Zeus and this is Hermes. They started to give them the names of gods because people like to idolize. And sadly, instead for pastors to be rejecting that status and keep committing people to God, like Paul tore his shirt and, and Barnabas tore their shirt and said, no, we are men like you, don't worship us. We are men like you, we are only being used to do what God has sent us to do. But it is natural. If the body of Christ does not revert to that place where, yes, reverence is given to the office for the sake of order and accountability, but refusing to idolize men and women as semi-gods, and those ones also are not rejecting that, that, that devilish status, then the body of Christ will be missing the point. Every one pastor is a human being. Every one pastor can fall like any other human being. Every one pastor is just another person that God has called to give some work to. I say this in context because this is something that anybody going into ministry must understand. And this is something that everybody in the body of Christ must understand. If you expect your pastor not to make mistakes, you will be disappointed. It is no guarantee, it is no, it is no blank check to say be making mistakes as a pastor, but if the congregation and the people always expect this 100% perfect person, no, they don't even stop at that. They expect him to be perfect or her to be perfect, expect their spouse to be perfect. Even their innocent children are expected to be perfect. <laughs> their children that know that are just trying to understand life themselves. People, we, we have done this disservice to the body of Christ. They say, you're a pastor? Oh, wow, okay, that's pastor's wife. Now, the moment they say, that's pastor's wife, that lady must be, in everything, she must be perfect. The moment she says something, they say, and she's pastor's wife. <laughs> she's just a human being. He's just a human being. Because this is where, if we start from this understanding, Paul said, I am a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Why did he say that? Because he recognizes, and he's also said, and a partaker of the glory. He was with him on Mount Transfiguration, and he saw many things, even up to his ascension. But the reality is that what, Paul, what Peter is saying here is that I am a witness and I am a partaker, even though I am also a man like you. One of, the, one, of the, one of the biggest things that Jesus saw in his ministry was not the piercing of the side. One of the biggest pains that he saw in his, in his three and a half years of ministry was not the piercing of the side, not even the nail to the, to the, to the, to the, to the cross. No, 
I'm sure those were not as painful as when he looked around and he saw Peter saying, I don't know him. I believe. And every pastor must understand that one, some of the pains that you will find in pastoral ministry doesn't come from those people who are abusing you on social media, don't, I don't know you, or people who talk about you elsewhere. It will usually come from the very people you love the most. The very people you have ate with, the very people you have dined with, the very people that you are pouring your heart to, to serve. He said, but I am like you. I am a fellow person like you. Then verse 2 says, shepherd the flock. That is your duty, verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. It is called the flock of God. The respect I have for you is not because your name is Mary. I hope there's no Mary here. Or your name is uh, whatever it is. That's not the respect I have for you. Or your name is David. It's not the respect I have for you. I thank God for that. The respect I have for you is the fact that I understand that you are a flock of God. You are of God. You are God's property. I am not permitted to treat you anyhow. I can't. I can't. Neither are you permitted to treat me anyhow. You can't. We are all God's property. I am under shepherd by the grace of God, shepherding the flock of God, and the Bible says serving as overseers. Overseers there mean somebody who has a global perspective. That's why when people come from different departments and different groups, they'll say, we want to do this. I want brother this to do this. I want sister this to do this. I say, yes, 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 yes. But you see, there are many things about brother this and sister this that you don't know. That they are doing other things. That they are involved in many other things. And they even have a present challenge now that you may not know. So when I say to you, okay, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. Give me time. It's not that I'm foolish. <laughs> I'm taking time overseeing. Making sure there is a balance. Making sure that that thing can be done by Brother C because Brother C has to be put in perspective. And then not by compulsion. I don't know how somebody will say God called him into ministry and every day all he opens his mouth to do is to keep abusing the people and cursing them. I'm, I'm <laughs> that is a man doing it by compulsion. He says not by compulsion, but what? Willingly. It means you are doing it with or without incentive, you are just willing to do it. And not for dishonest gain, but what? Eagerly. I've talked a little bit about this honest gain when we talked about prophets the last time, but I want to re-emphasize this. If your decision to go into pastoring is so that you can have dishonest gain, please, I beg of you, don't bother to go. Just go and be selling Forex or something, <laughs> go and find something to be selling. If your motive is to make money in any of the ministries, then you are wrong. Am I saying God will not, does not bless those who serve him? Oh, he blesses them immeasurably. He blesses them in abundance. But you don't come into these roles because you want a blessing. You come into this role because you are called into it and you are empowered by God to do it and then you are doing it willingly and not for dishonest gain. Be eager about it. Verse 3 says, not as being lords, authoritarian, not as being lords over those who, those entrusted to you, but being what? Examples. A pastor must be exemplary. If I say to you, be here at so-so time, Except I have traveled out of the area and, uh, and it's a meeting I'm supposed to attend or there is uh, some other meeting that I'm coming from that I may be late. I will be there. I will make sure that you don't meet me. I, I don't come there to meet you. Example. Example. Those of you that have been praying with us since uh, that have joined the prayers, that have joined the prayers many times, you will notice that except I travel, except I travel, hardly will you be there at 5 a.m. and I'm not there. Because it is example. I'm not trying to prove anything to you. I'm just being an example. So if you come late, I can tell you, why did you come late there? Because it's, I've given you the example. He said, be examples. Be examples. It is easier to lord things over people than to be examples unto them. It is hard work to be an example. It is hard work to be an example in your marriage. It is hard work to be an example in your parenting. It is hard work to be an example in how people see you outside the church. It is hard work. If you are to be an example, you must trust the chief shepherd. As an under shepherd, you must trust the chief shepherd for the grace to be good example. Peter said, be example. 
And then verse 4. Let's read verse 4 together. Everyone called into pastoral ministry, whatever level, keep remembering this. It will keep you going. Let's go together, everybody. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That should give you gladness. That should give you joy. Every day you wake up as a pastor, every day you wake up, that should encourage you to know that you have a cheap shepherd you are responsible to, and he himself will make sure that you keep enjoying the grace to serve and that you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Since he is the chief shepherd and he is also known as the good shepherd, he talked about himself. This is the Lord Jesus himself. He talked about himself in the book of John chapter 10, and I would like us all to look at about five things. We can pick many, but about five things that should be the quality of a good pastor, the quality of a good pastor, and how those who he has been called to pastor should relate with him. John chapter 10, let's read John chapter 10 from verse 11. The first thing is that he must be sacrificial. When I say he, I'm not saying it's only for men. That means they must be sacrificial. Pastors must be sacrificial like the good shepherd. Verse 11, Jesus said, I am the, verse 11, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Every pastor and everyone called to be an under shepherd must be willing to give their life, in quote, for the sheep. God has not called any other person to die for another person again. Jesus Christ has done that for every one of us. Praise the Lord. He has done that for every one of us. But we must understand that he has called us to give sacrificially of our time and resources as we serve. A pastor is not primarily meant to be getting from the people. He's primarily meant to be giving to the people. He's meant to be enabling the people to look at what he can do to add value to the people. The pastoral ministry is a responsible office. The shepherding office is that which is always looking at the sheep and making sure that they are fed, making sure that the next pasture is available for them to eat, making sure that the, the hireling is not coming into them, like we will see in, in what Jesus said, making sure of many things, helping them, looking at the one who is weak and trying to help them to stand. That is the pastoral duty sacrificial. It will cost you your sleep many times. It will cost you your money many times. It will cost you your time many times. It will cost you many things. It will cost you even some holidays many times. In doing this, however, they must never forget that they are under shepherds who must always be pointing everyone to the chief shepherd. Like I said earlier on, one of the mistakes made in the body of Christ today is that a lot of pastors say the buck stops here. The buck doesn't stop if there's any buck whatever. It doesn't stop with you at all. It stops with your chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And again, this is one thing. You see, a lot of pastors feel that they lose their, a lot of pastors don't feel insecure when they are not making themselves viewed by the people as that, like I said, that superstar rock status. So they feel insecure. This is what is causing the problem. And that's why when, you, when, 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 when matters are, are brought to them, they, they try to do things to make it look as if there is some solution they have in themselves. Now, I'm not saying the pastor should not be a strong person. That you come to him with a problem, he starts to cry every time. Hey, ha, what are we going to do? That's not what I'm talking about. But this idea of painting a picture as if you have all the solution is wrong. John chapter 15 verse 5, Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me you can do nothing. He said, abide in me and my words, are, if my words abide in you. He said, you let your words, my words abide in you. He said, because without me you can do nothing. 
Without the chief shepherd, no under shepherd can do anything. So the work of the under shepherd is to keep pointing people to the one who has all solutions. Hallelujah. But you see, sadly, because of the psyche of people, many people like to see that rock star status. Because like I said, it's idolatry. It has come from the background of idolatry. Uh, from idolatry backgrounds, and it is also psychologically soothing to have confidence in a man that you can see than to be told by that man that you should believe a God that you cannot see. Am I making sense? Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is easy. It is easier for people when, when, the, when that man that they can see says, yeah, don't worry, it is sorted now. It is sorted now. This time five days is over. <laughs> and they say, that man is powerful. But the one who says, let us pray about it. I want to trust God with you. This is what the Bible says. Let us go to the Lord. He said, I don't like this kind of pastor. <laughs> I want him to just tell me it is over. What is it with you? Where are we going again? I don't know. Don't I know how to go to the Lord? Okay, go to the Lord now. <laughs> the man is pointing you the right direction. And if you are pastoring or aspiring to be pastor in pastoring, especially at church level, I beg of you, let this be. You know what? Anybody that cannot appreciate that is better they leave you alone than for you to now try to make something happen for them. Many people have found themselves in problem because of this. Trying to be God to people. Be sacrificial by all means, but always remember that you are not the chief shepherd. This has nothing to do with us abdicating our responsibilities or being less affair about it. The reality is that if a true pastor is told about your concerns and the things that, that trouble you, it's in their heart as much as it's in your heart. You can't believe it. You can't believe it. They are thinking about it every day. They are thinking about it every day. That's why at times you get a random call that I saw this thing and I think it will be applicable for you. After two weeks, three weeks, at times one month of you telling them that this was a situation, a true pastor will be thinking about it more, but not worrying about it because he has handed it over to God, but it will be as part of what he thinks continuously in what he can do to be of help to you. So they must be sacrificial. They must be caring. Number two, let's go to verse 12. John chapter 10, verse 12. He said, but a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and does what? He flees. And the wolves catches the sheep and scatters them. Verse 13 says, the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. The hireling does not care. So the second characteristic is that the pastor must be trustworthy. He must be trustworthy. The pastor must be trustworthy. He must be trustworthy. He must have integrity. You must be able to trust a pastor with your life. You must be able to trust a pastor with your wife. You must be able to trust a pastor with your husband. You must be able to trust a pastor with your children. You must be able to trust a pastor with your money. You must be able to trust a pastor with your life. I know I said he's a human being. I know I said he is an under shepherd. But there is an anointing upon him that helps him to function in that office that should allow you to trust him. He must not be seen as a hireling. And for pastors, the things that are wolves in our times are not necessarily what are looking like physical wolves that jump into a herd of sheep and tries to scatter them. Yes, they are, but not limited to that. You must understand that your personal challenges can be wolves at times. Some of you don't know. People don't know that pastors have personal challenges like them. Many times when a pastor is counseling you about your money situation, he might be going through a financial challenge as well. 
But his duty is not to, when you bring your problem, you say, is that all? You are, you are saying 5,000 is your problem, as I am now. You know, I wish I could have 20,000. <laughs> That's not his duty. He might have a 20,000 pound challenge, but the reality is that he is, he is to serve and support you and to pray with you to help you to get through that challenge. Your personal challenges, pastors, may come in as wolves many times. And as a matter of fact, no pastor ever lives without personal challenges. People don't know this. People think that pastors are always, just always sorted. And the reality is that truly God helps pastors. God fights for those he has called. I have no doubt about that. But the things that pastors go through, you can't believe. And many times God allows them to go through it so that they can sympathize with you. There is nothing that happens to people that have not, have not had before. Is it loss of a loved one? Is he failing an exam? Is he not, not passing an interview? Is it whatever? Is it loss of, even when before I got married, I was turned down by somebody, I've told you that before. So if a young man comes to me now and he says, ah, that this girl, I'm going to die. I'll say, don't die, because <laughs> I've been there before. <laughs> don't die, don't kill yourself. There are many, 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 many more <laughs> that you can choose from, hallelujah. So personal challenges can be wolves. They come in and they attempt to want to stop you from doing the work. They want to destabilize your mind so that the sheep can be scattered. Don't allow them. Don't allow unruly and betraying sheep. Unruly and betraying sheep. They are wolves. When they become unruly, and what I've found in pastoring is that I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to understand how this. The Bible talks about wolves in sheep clothing. I used to think that these are people who come from outside and pretend to be part of the sheep, which is true. But sadly, sadly, anyone who is a sheep and has been loyal and has been serving well, who allows the seed of bitterness to come into them for whatever reason, and they begin to spread it in the, among the brethren, have also become wolves. They were sheep, but allowing the spirit of the enemy, the spirit of bitterness, the Bible says it is not to be allowed to take root so that it does not defile many. Such have become wolves. Many pastors have given up and have not been doing right with their pastoring work because they have been betrayed many times. If you are a pastor, if your chief shepherd was betrayed, friend, you will be betrayed. You will be betrayed. I am not praying it for myself or any pastor, but the reality is that betrayal is part and parcel of the calling. What is betrayal? Being lied against, what is betrayal? Being told, being, being denied when they're supposed to be a standing up for. Every ministry I've served, there is nobody anywhere that is ever allowed to speak negative about my pastor. It's impossible. I won't entertain it. Even when there is something to discuss, the moment you want to take it to negative, I'll say, no, stop there. We need to go to the man and discuss this. But we find believers today who don't care. They take their pastor to him like uh, to a stick. Just uh, that man, take his wife, eat that one, finish him. <laughs> the children will be used for dessert. <laughs> On the dining table, they are cutting that. You don't mind that pastor. I told him. As he's putting the chicken there, he say, don't, don't mind him. We will see what he will do. We will all live now. We will see what he will do. <laughs> All kinds of things. They chew the man, chew the wife. Joyce Meyer is the one that first said this thing. I laugh. He said, don't use your pastor as main cause and your, <laughs> your pastor as your, your, the wife, pastor's wife as a pre-cause. What do they call that one? A sweetener. Sweetener. Eh? Starter. Yes. Don't use her as starter. Then pastor as main cause and then the children as dessert. <laughs> I say, Joyce, is wonderful. <laughs> but that happens. I don't lie down on my bed and start talking about people negatively. Not to talk of pastors. And I'll be telling my wife, oh, do you see that brother? See that sister? No, no, no. When we are talking, we are talking about what we can do to improve people. Are we, do we not have things to discuss as to when there's misunderstanding? We do. But we're always looking positive. We're always looking positive. But couples don't even know. People don't even have the fear of God. The Bible says there was a man who was speaking in his bedroom and God had it. God had it. God will hear everything you are saying against them. Don't be unruly and don't be a betraying sheep. 
Betraying sheep are people that you have helped. You have done your best to do everything. You have, you have stood for them in their own time of difficulty. You have done everything. You have given them money many times. Do you know that I told, tell you that I do some consulting work and everything. At times, some of the money I'm talking is not more than 300 pounds that I'm paid for it. So some write a letter to validate something. You pay 300 pounds. Many times I've earned that kind of money, remove what is government this thing, and just and, and my tithe out of it, and just pass the rest to brethren. Many times, not once, not two. I can't even count the number of times. Many times. Because this is, this is what it's all about. But then some of those people that you sacrifice for like that, when my own children have need, that at times I'll say, wait. Not because I'm saying I'm not going to do it for them, but because I see that there's a pressing need here. Somebody has a very big challenge here that if something doesn't happen within 24 hours, it can be a problem. I'll say, take that money instead. At times, four figures. Because I said 300 now, you say, ah, that pastor is, at times it's more than that, much more than that. Praise the Lord. What am I trying to say? When such people betray you, the tendency is that you will not want to help anybody again. Even if you keep pastoring, the next one comes, you say, pastor, ah, this is happening. You say, okay, well, God bless you. <laughs> All you people who take my money, you'll be saying in your heart. All you people who take my money and still go away, behave you like, God bless you, it is well with you. The Lord bless you. <laughs> and keep you. <laughs> and you sing all those songs. <laughs> May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. That might say, ah, thy child, sir, we need to pay. And be gracious unto you. <laughs> and be gracious unto you. You become unnecessarily super spiritual. <laughs> because, not that you don't have the money, not that you don't want to do it, because you keep remembering. I've done this many times, they take my money and they still behave. But you don't stop because there is a chief shepherd who is coming and his reward, your reward is in his hand. Hallelujah. Don't let any kind of wolf catch the sheep and scatter them. Some spiritual attacks can also be very, very bitter. We face spiritual attacks. Many times I've told you a few, just very tiny bit of some of the spiritual attacks I face. Some of you that were here long enough would remember, and obviously I'm sure Pastor Cephas will remember this, when we came here in 2013, late, or early 2014, one Friday night. Those times pastors used to pray Friday night, and we had to come and pray around this altar. There was a time we started the church, things were going well, and then suddenly when I get up here, in this church, on this same pulpit, when I get up here, it will seem as if something is pressing me by force. You know this thing that happens to you, in the, that happens to people in the dream? What do they call it? I don't know what is called it today. It used to happen to me many, many years ago. You'll be there, you'll be trying to shout, Jesus, you can't move. <laughs> Believe me, it's almost of that order. But people didn't know. And I would say, praise the Lord, let's go. Ah. Then I went home and said, ah, inside church. <laughs> I called the brethren, I called the brethren. Pastor, you remember that time? I called Pastor Cephas, there were some other pastors here then. I called and I said, let's pray, this altar. Whoever comes in here and is doing witchcraft, it was not until, until after that time, some things happened like that, and some people left. This was early 2014. Some people left, and at Sif, and since that day, and forever and ever in Jesus' name, it will never happen again. But these are some of the things, spiritual attack. Spiritual attack. At times, it's very heavy. At times, your children are attacked. For no reason, you just find that something is going wrong. They attacked. Your spouse is attacked. At times your job is attacked. For no reason. At times your business is attacked. But you must stand. Part of what calls you is you must remain. What God calls you is to keep having integrity to stand. The Lord will continue to help you to stand. In the name of Jesus. I'm saying this in twofold because we're talking about pastoral ministry. So this is much more for those who are serving in that office or will be called into that office. But also a little bit of insight so that you can know how you pray for pastors and support them in that role. Hallelujah. Don't be like that man who was sleeping in, in, in his house one day and uh, his mother came and knocked the door. Said, called his name. He said, won't you, John, won't you go to church today? He said, no, I'm not going to church. The people don't like me, and I don't like them. The woman said, well, I will give you two reasons why you should go to church. Number one, you are 49 years old. And then number two, you are the pastor of the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
That was one of Joel Osteen's jokes. But it was very funny to me. The pastor didn't want to go to church. And in all honesty, I have heard in this my time, I've heard of pastors who told me, Brother Dave, honestly, every Sunday I get afraid to go and face my own people. I say, what? I get afraid. The moment I'm thinking of the next Sunday, fear sets in. Pastors, those are demonic things that the devil has been doing to try to cripple the church. But we will keep overcoming. I say, we'll keep overcoming. In the name of Jesus. Ah, that devil will run away first too. The devil that tries to make me not want to love church and God's people, he will run away first in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number three, number three, verse 14. Very quickly now, verse 14. He said, I am the good shepherd and I am known by my sheep. And, and I'm sorry, let me read it again. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. This is very important. A pastor must be responsible, providing diligent care. He knows his sheep and they know him. And this must be responsive. A pastor's responsibility over you is to the degree to which you give him. This is another thing that is crippling the body of Christ today. We have a lot of people who claim that they have been wounded. They have been wounded by many pastors before. They told them something, and then the next thing is everybody is hearing it. Uh, they, 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 they told them, there is even some pastors that, that ladies went to complain to them that they're having problem with their, with their marital matters in, 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 in spouses. I, I've just put it that way. And then because of that, the pastor is trying to take advantage of the woman. So all kinds of things, all kinds of junk have happened, and I know that they happen. But the reality is that a true pastor is not somebody that you should not be able to confide in. There are many things that I've heard from people. My wife and I have known each other for 28 years. 28 years by the grace of God. Married 25 of those by this December by God's grace. There are some things that people told me when we first knew each other, when I was not even pastoring the church, but I was a youth leader and a kind of group leader, associate pastor. People told me as far back as 1995, 96, 97, till today. She hasn't heard one word of it from me. Even though we are no longer with those people, things have moved on, everybody has gone. One word, not even people who have treated me harshly afterwards in some cases. I didn't use that one to say, you see how that man behaved? Uh -huh. Let me now tell you all their secrets. <laughs> because at times, out of anger, some pastors will do that. They say, I want to. Then she will say, Hey, I didn't. Ah, I, you have not heard anything. He even told me this and told me that. <laughs> That's an immature pastor, an irresponsible pastor. So Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I'm, I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. A good pastor must seek to be a good custodian of the flock under God. They must be willing, and then, but the people also must be willing. The people must be submissive, and the people must maintain good communication. Friends, I know that God reveals things, and at times God reveals things to me about you. He does that. But there are many things that God will not reveal to me because you are supposed to tell me. God does not do what we are meant to do. <laughs> God does not do what we are meant to do. So don't say, I'm going through all this and nobody knows. Who did you tell? He said, if they are spiritual, they should know. Okay, be looking for spiritual. It's very wrong. It's, it is one of the most demonic things that is happening today. If you, I'm not saying that everything that happens to you, of course, things happen and you can take care of many things. That's fine. But there are certain things that can lead to other problems that you don't know. Let me give you an example. Something happens, maybe there is a couple that have a challenge. I'm just giving a, a rough example now. Maybe there's a couple that have a challenge and it's serious, maybe that to the point whereby they're even, they've even gone to the divorce courts. That's not happening here by the grace of God, I'm just telling you. And they've not mentioned one word to the pastor. Now, if people hear it, okay, what might happen is that the people who hear it will think that the pastor has known about it and nothing has been done to allow it to degenerate to that extent. Because many people who go to divorce court, believe me, I believe that many times, outside cases of very clear abuse and obvious reasons where it is just not working, 
outside those kind of cases, many times a step that they need to take might save that whole process. Many times, because it's ignorance. It's ignorance in many cases. And when they are taught what to do, and they practice it in many cases, I've seen it over and over again. Marriages get restored. Relationships get restored. But if they don't know, if the pastor doesn't know, how will he, how does he, how do you expect him or her to be a part of it? So we have a responsibility. The pastor must be responsible to know the sheep. Peter said, know the state of your flock. He must be responsible to know the sheep, but we must understand that the biggest responsibility is we being willing, we being a people who are submissive. Again, I say, people say, oh, I've been accountable, I've been responsible before, I've been open, and it has been used against me. I beg of you, don't let the enemy continue to rob you in such a Or the other one I've heard is, I don't want to trouble pastor with my worries. And I've told you many times, I don't worry for myself, so I will not worry for you. Praise the Lord. John 6, 25, Jesus said, do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. So that's what I follow. I do not worry. I'm not being proud or arrogant. Go and read your own Bible. If in your own Bible says, worry, 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 John 6, 25, if you all say, worry, worry, worry now, worry about everything, then keep doing that. But if your Bible says, do not worry, you better join me. That's what my Bible says. So I don't worry. Whatever it is, what is there in, what, what, what is there in this world that nobody has faced before? There's nothing. There's nothing, no problem in this world that nobody has, that, 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 that has not been faced by people before. So we don't worry. What we do, what I do personally is that, I, like I said, I commit it to God for you, and we trust God for a breakthrough. Please, let us have respect for the institution of the pastoral office. There are, church, there are leaders within your unit that need to know if you are going through certain things. They've called for a meeting, and you are not going to be able to come because a child or something is happening, and you are not going to be able to be there. Let them know. Don't just say, it's my own thing, and then you just keep away. Let them know. Let them know if there is an issue, please always make sure that it is told. I have said this many times across countries by the grace of God over the last 30 years, that until the church understands the place of confidentiality and the place of trust, we will keep limiting ourselves. When Daniel was confronted, he went to his companions. These days, how many companions can you go to in the body of Christ? How many people are confident that if they don't, if they come and tell you that this is what their husband said last night or their wife said last night, they will not hear it from their neighbor tomorrow? This is the problem. So we all have to come into that place of responsibility, being one another's keeper, being brother's keepers, but as pastors, it is very, very important. There are many things that my wife has been told that I don't know as well. This is how we live our lives. What we should share, we share. But the people know that we are sharing. If I talk about, if you tell me something, and I'm going to tell my wife, I tell you, I'm going to discuss this with my wife because it is better. Because if you come to me, for example, as a woman, and we are talking about general issues that you are going through, if it gets to some certain aspect, I will not, I will tell you, okay, I think where we have reached on this talk now, have a word with my wife. That's where some pastors make mistakes. They carry on. They don't know where to draw the line. So they carry on, plus what they should not counsel and what they should not see, they start to see. <laughs> Somebody wants to show you something somewhere in her body. You say, I'm pastor. Oh, oh, eh. <laughs> you say, ah, no, 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 don't open it. You know what? I'll have to book appointment. You will see my wife. She will look at it for you. Praise the Lord. You say, pastor, is here. He's just painting me here. If you can't see it. No, I don't want to see it. <laughs> I don't want to see it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But it's all part of the trust. It's all part of the accountability and what we must understand. That takes me to number four, accountable. We must be accountable. This accountability is we must draw strength from the Father. Jesus said in verse 15, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus would always say, Father, I thank you that you hear me always. He will say, Father, not my will, nevertheless, not if it was possible, let this cup in Gethsemane, let this cup pass over me. He said, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He would always talk to his father, Father, glorify your son so that he can glorify you. He said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, he said finally, when he departed. We need to understand uh, when, when, he, when he was crucified. He said, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. So a pastor must be accountable to the Father very well. Keep drawing strength from the Father to do the work. This is the key to overcoming burnout. 
Many pastors are burning out in our day and age today because they carry what they should not be carrying. I say this with a very deep sense of, of pain. Pastors should not be burned out. I said to my pastor friend, the one that spoke with us during the anniversary, we were talking last week on the phone and just thanking God for many things like we always do. The wife teased us. He said, you guys, when you, are, when you get into this, your mode of celebrating God, that you can go for hours. And we laughed. And that's the reality. We may not spoke, speak for weeks and months at times, but when we speak, we just recount the goodness of God and charge each other and charge each other with the things of God. And I said to him, I said, Pastor Hendricks, you know, burnout is not of God. God told me, he said, burnout is as a result of pride. He said, wow, Brother Dave, you have shared something with me today. God told me. He said, when you burn out as a pastor, it's because of your own pride. You just cannot humble yourself to bring the matters that are troubling you to God. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So it is, his promise is rest. He said, take my yoke upon you. He said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we burn out, it's because we are refusing out of our own arrogance, sadly, we may not know it, to submit and surrender to him. I believe pastors should not burn out. Pastors should not burn out. If you are feeling overwhelmed, call your brethren, pray for you. But many times, use the wisdom of God not to get to that point. Whatever you cannot do, don't compete with anybody. A lot of people are competing. A lot of people are competing. They, they will look at the church, they will say, ah, that man, we started, he started five years ago. Now they have 1,000 people. That one, this is it. Who told you that everybody's path is the same? Some people will never pass more than 50 people in this life. And those 50 will go to heaven with them. Beautiful. Some will have to pastor five million because that is their mandate, and they will take that five million to heaven. Beautiful. Find your level, find whatever God is doing, and enjoy it. Rest in God. Tell neighbor for me, keep resting in God. Doesn't mean we don't work hard to improve and stretch out. We do, but we must learn how to rest. The last point there, number five, the pastor must be large-hearted. Jesus said in verse 16, and other sheep, I have, which are not of this fold, them I must also bring, that they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Other sheep I have, which are not part of this fold. We must be large-hearted, demonstrating the willpower to love, the willpower to forgive, and accommodating those who have backslid, even those who have betrayed us in time past, but are now repentant. You must be willing to embrace the broken, the bruised, those who have been hurt in other places. You must be willing to embrace them and pray for them that they don't get hurt again because if they get hurt again, they may be driven out of the kingdom forever. Now, having said this, I will again repeat, it is impossible for a pastor to love anybody that doesn't want his love. It is impossible. There are people out there today that were part of this church before and I'm grateful to God for their lives. I still text them on their birthdays. I still greet them when I have the opportunity. I call at times from time to time. In many cases, we just, you know, exchange pleasantries. But sadly, there are people who I will text and still will not reply until today. They never told me what it is that got them so upset. But I hear snippets of things from people. Don't be a part of that demonic trend. You will carry that bitterness to another church and afflict them. Don't do it. It's crippling the body of Christ. Let's be mature men and women. Let's be open. Let's be able to speak to each other and say, this is the problem or this is the issue. Many times, a lot of the misunderstanding in the body of Christ today are fables. Misunderstandings, they are called. Misunderstanding. Wrong perspective of understanding. But we carry them on and carry them on. And some people will even tell their children, Let's not be that. But a pastor must have a large heart. God has told me many times, he said, anybody who leaves, if they, if they leave your, the, the congregation, and if at any time they come back, he showed me a picture, he said, do your hands like the, the, the father of the prodigal son, be waiting to embrace. Because it's not about me, it's about God's people. I know my biological children, 
the ones that God has given to me. Every other person is a flock of God. Even though they are also a heritage of the Lord, but every other person is a flock of God. So I don't treat you like personal property. I want you to believe God. As a pastor, you must be large-hearted. Jesus said, there are many who are not of this fold. There are many people I pastor today by the grace of God for many years, for many, many years that are geographically distant from me. They communicate with me. They share with me. They allow me to pray into their lives. They, when they want to get married, they let me know. When they're having children, they let me know. It has gone on for years. I've started counseling people like that since I was 19 by the grace of God. Because I had a rapid education, I was almost finishing university. So somehow, a lot of things were thrust on me early in life. Let us have a large heart. May God continue to help us. In the name of Jesus. I was going to take you through Paul's writing in Acts 20. I will share it during the morning prayer meetings, God helping us from verse 20 to 26 to 32. But I will want to read verse 29 to, for us to be very careful not to allow us to be used against the work of the pastor or the pastoral ministry. Verse 29, say, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Then verse 30 is very key. Verse 30, he said, also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. I have seen this happen many times in many churches, and we need to be reminding ourselves let your life never get to the point where the devil succeeds in using you to scatter the disciples. No matter what happened, no matter what happened, if you cannot have a dialogue and have a conversation and it being resolved, whatever it is, with whoever, whatsoever, even if it is me, I beg of you, just take your things, as painful as this may sound, just take your things and move on We'll pray for you and trust God to leave you. Allow us to pray for you. But to be speaking perverse things, disturbing the pastoral ministry, giving the pastor more headache than he's already carrying, giving him more hassle, giving her more hassle, let's not be part of that. These are demonic ploys to affect the church and to make the work of pastoring more difficult. The harder pastoring is, the more difficult it is to gather the saints. And when there are no saints, who are we going to equip? When we don't equip people, how can the world out there be reached? Can you see the strategy of the devil? The church is key. Let us be a part of those who are building the church significantly. Let us never be a part of those who scatter the church. May God continue to grant us grace in the name of Jesus. Let's bow our heads now.